very great pleasure to be here this evening. Um, my talk tonight, I put a lot of thought into what I wanted to cover with this sort of audience, and, and, and essentially I'm going to give you a thank you sandwich. I'm going to start with acknowledgments to some key people, organizations who have enabled me to do the work that I do. I will then give you the cheese of the sandwich that is uh, a little bit about the discipline of ecology from my perspective. So I think hopefully I might challenge some perceptions that some of you have about what it means to be an ecologist. There's my young daughter waving in the background. Um, the, the third sort of objective of the talk is to tell you a little bit about my research. That is sort of what questions I sort of focus on, why I think those are the most important questions to be focusing on at the moment, a bit about how I do it, um, and some of, the, some of the results, just to give examples of, of really what it means to be an ecologist. And I'll finish again with a thank you sandwich with the acknowledgments at the end. Okay. So the, the first acknowledgments really have to go to this university for giving me the position that I have and the academic freedom that I have to pursue the research that I think is the most important. So in addition to giving me the position, they also provide me with the facilities and, and infrastructure that I need to do the work that I do. And as an ecologist, what I really need is access to, to field sites, um, such as the Wellington South Coast, shown in this beautiful image. And we're very fortunate at our university to have this coastal ecology lab located right here, which is essentially my gateway into this natural laboratory. So the coastal ecology lab provides everything I need to do my work, access to diving and boating facilities, um, lab spaces and seawater systems so I can go out into the field and, and study the organisms that live there in their natural environment and I can bring them back into the lab and study them further. Also need to acknowledge the Marsden Fund which has been very generous over the years in supporting my work and again it's allowed me to focus on the research questions that I think are the most important. Um, it's also allowed me to attract some great postgraduate students and postdocs and bring them into this sort of research fold. Um, and it's allowed me to work with some great people, um, both in New Zealand and overseas. And so four of those people I want to give a special acknowledgement to are, are shown here. These are my current collaborators on my, my latest Marsden grant. They're all people who I've been very close friends with for, for a long time. Went to grad school with most of them, um, and we've kept in contact and kept working over the years. And Marsden's enabled us to get together and, and, and do science, which is what we love to do. Um, and lastly, I just want to um, acknowledge my family, but both for sort of making the effort to come tonight, for giving me the freedom and permission to go overseas to do the research that I do, which often takes me away for sometimes long periods of time. Um, and as you'll see in this talk, this is really a talk about the, the importance and value of, of, of children. Okay. Um, so now on to the next part of the talk. So, I, so this is a question, what is ecology? This is a question I often pose to my, my incoming undergraduate students in our very first lecture. And to be honest, I'm not surprised by the answers I get. And the answers I get are what, what I, I believe a lot of people think of when they, when they see this word ecology. And when I Google the word ecology, I also get a set of images that, that look like this. All images that there's nothing inherently wrong with these images. They, 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 lots of sort of clean green images showing people holding the earth in their hands, recycling, um, conservation type images. And a lot of people, I think, have this perception that ecology is equivalent to conservation or environmentalism. And now envir environmentalism is, is advocacy for the environment, right? And that's a very important thing and it's good that people do that, but it's not what ecology is. Ecology is a science. And it's a quantitative science. It's all about collecting data and, and being as objective as we possibly can to understand how the natural system works. So ecologists will use a variety of techniques. We will do experiments, we will do observational studies, we might do longitudinal studies to follow populations through time. And we borrow from other disciplines like mathematics and chemistry and physics um, to, and apply some of those tools to understand uh, how these systems work. And so we use evidence-based uh, sort of knowledge, right? We figure out how the works, world works through, through data and through evidence. And, and, and what an ecologist will tell you is that the world is changing. Of course, it's always been changing. It always is changing. Um, and the oceans are changing. But increasingly, many of these changes we can attribute to the activities of, of ourselves, of, of humans. And as our populations grow, we place additional pressures on, on these natural systems. We do things like fish. We, 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 we make waste that sometimes goes into the ocean. Um, a whole litany of potential threats that I think many of you will appreciate, will have seen in the, in the news repeatedly and, and recently, some hot topics in the news um, this week, some of these things. Um, these are all things that um, e ecology can't say anything about whether these are good or bad. Those are societal decisions. And society has decided that some of these activities or some of the outcomes of these processes have undesirable effects. And for that reason, we, we try to manage the, those threats. So we try to uh, manage to, 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 to make things better. Right? And so there's this sort of 
underlying idea that, that, that these things are, ha there are threats that are happening to our oceans. We're putting pressures on our oceans. But through good management, we can reduce those or mitigate those or make them go away. And so management can provide uh, solutions, provided we have good, sound management. Um, and this is essentially where ecology can, can play a really important role, and particularly the subfield of applied ecology, which is essentially like ecologists who are acting as doctors for the environment who apply existing knowledge to try and come up with, with solutions, fix-it issues for, for environmental problems. And that's all well and good, but if you look at the discipline of applied ecology, it's filled with examples of where, despite our best attempts, we actually do more harm than good. And the classic example in New Zealand is, of course, the introduction of stoats. Um, brought into New Zealand to try and control the proliferation of rabbits, and instead those stoats ate their way through our native bird life. Right? And that's a, that's, a, that's a classic sort of example of our best attempts to try and implement a little bit of ecological knowledge and actually making things worse. And that's obviously not what we want to do. So what, what's really important in, in, in management is that we have a good understanding of how these natural systems work. And this is really where my work comes in. So I don't work necessarily directly on applied issues, but I work on the knowledge that, that underlies um, a lot of these uh, potential management tools. And one of the things that's really important to understand is um, the life history of marine organisms, um, how they make their living, essentially the life cycle of these things. Because the life history of marine organisms differs quite markedly from what we're used to thinking about. It differs from you and I, differs from your cat or your dog or your, your, your sheep or whatever. Um, and, really important thing to take home here is the, the, the different life stages. Adults, babies, do very different things. They spend time in different environments. Um, they move over different spatial scales. And they're exposed to different threats. And so if you don't appreciate this as, as a manager, you, you're, you're going to mess things up. Um, this diagram is meant to sort of represent the life history that's characteristic of most marine reef organisms. It doesn't matter if you're talking about seaweeds or invertebrates or fish. They all pretty much have this life cycle, where the adults live on in this case, rocky reefs on the Wellington South Coast. And they make babies that, that are released into the ocean, carried on ocean currents, and go God knows where. We don't really know where the babies go. And some of those babies might be lucky enough to find their way back to a reef to replenish these populations. OK, so that's a really important thing to understand uh, with regards to the life history. Now, another way in which marine organisms differ in their life history from, from you and I, or from most things we're familiar with, is, is the way in which they uh, invest in, in their babies. So take us, humans, for example. We, we make a small number of babies, typically one baby per spawn, and we invest a lot of energy and resources into those small number of babies. Right? We spend time feeding them and raising them and trying to angst over which schools to send them to so they have the best opportunities in life. And we may even spend time carving little fruit hats to put on them to decorate them. Right? Um, marine organisms don't spend any time carving out fruit hats. They don't invest heavily in their offspring. Instead, they make lots of babies. Take an example here, an enemy fish, the, the, the poster child, the star of Finding Nemo. These are baby anemone fish here laid on, on a bit of coral reef. Now, a mother anemone fish will lay between 600 and 1,500 babies each time she spawns. And she might spawn once a month over the course of her life, which might be sort of 10 to 15 years. Um, another example. So anemone fish are actually at the low end of this baby factory spectrum. Cod, North Atlantic cod, the poster child for overfishing. Um, a female cod of average size will make between 4 million and 6 million babies each time she spawns. She spawns up to seven times a year. Um, and she might live well over 100 years if she's not caught by the fishery. Right? So the key message here, marine life histories, fish make lots of babies. They're cranking out the babies. And they're not investing a lot um, in, in any one of them. OK, so the consequences of these sort of life history elements that we need to take into account is that these marine populations are incredibly variable. They're incredibly dynamic. So what you're seeing here are two different species of, of, of fish that are commercially harvested on top of the Pacific sardine, a graph showing the population cycles of Pacific sardine on the bottom, anchovies. So sardines, those little things that you, you had the funny can that you open up and you eat them. Nobody really eats them. Um, and anchovies, those things that are on our pizzas that people either love or they hate. Right? And what you're seeing here are, are these our population fluctuations over a very long time frame. This is a 2,000 year record of these fish populations growing and declining. And they grow quite a lot. They grow from anywhere from, they're, they're close to zero, and they spike up to about 40 or 50,000 fish, um, and then they crash. And they do this repeatedly through time. And this is happening. This is the natural state of affairs in the absence of any threats from us, in the absence of any fisheries. We're not doing much around 200 AD to sort of affect the oceans greatly. 
Okay, so, so again, that's, that's, that's an outgrowth of these life history traits of these marine organisms. So let's consider sardines a little bit further. They've got a classic marine life history. The females make lots of babies. A female sardine will make about 100,000 babies per year, every year of her life. And in that population I just showed you, there are about 10,000 females on average. It varies. It varies from zero to, to a lot. Um, but on average, over that period of 2,000 years, there were about 10,000 uh, females in the population. So that population, on average, is cranking out a billion babies per year. Now, most of those babies um, die. So, so the infant mortality rate for fish is extremely high. And when I say most, it, it, it's literally most. It's 99.99% or even more, probably several more nines on that of the babies will die. Um, but not always. So sometimes um, conditions are a little bit better, and you, you, you get a marginal increase in the survival of those baby fish. So take a case where only 99.98% of the fish die. Still, most are dying. But that, it, that trivial, seemingly trivial change in the environment gives us an extra 100,000 fish. So that's a lot of extra sardines from something that's quite small. So a, a small change in environ, environmental conditions, which might be associated with an El Nino, or might be something that, that we actively intervene to try and manage a system. So these babies represent a huge opportunity for, for us to, to manage. If we can understand what makes them tick, we might be able to actively sort of manage and, and, and get more fish. Right? And so it's pretty easy with, that sort of, with those sort of numbers happening, it's pretty easy to see why these things are, are bouncing all over the place. So, so you get a particularly good year, and the number of fish rockets up. Um, and because sardines are not very long-lived, they don't live for very long, it only takes a couple bad years in a row for the populations to, to crash back down. Oh, I should also, you might be wondering how we have 2,000 years of data on, on these fish. And that's sort of an interesting aside. These are, these are actually reconstructions of these fish populations based upon scale, fish scale deposits. So as the fish are swimming around in the ocean, scales are shedding off their bodies at kind of a constant rate, just like we lose hair. Those scales sink down to the bottom of the ocean. And, and we can take sediment cores, and we can identify the scales and different layers and date them. And so that's how these data are arrived at. OK, and, and so what this all illustrates is, is really the power of the babies. Right? The babies are driving the dynamics in, in, in these systems, certainly for sardines and anchovies, and, and in fact, for most marine organisms. It's all about what happens to the babies. So the real question that, 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 that I'm addressing, that, that I think marine ecologists should be addressing, is. What happens to all these baby fish? And, and it's, it's, it's a pretty much a, a, a wide open field for me to do the work that I do. We have no idea what happens to these babies because they're very small. They're on the order of a millimeter when they hatch from an egg. And there's billions of them. And the ocean's a very big place. It's a vast place. So we can't follow or track these things. We have no idea what happens to them. They disappear. And then some older stages come back at some time later, maybe. So that's the focus of my, my research and why I'm doing it, so what, I'm trying to understand what happens to the babies. OK, so with that in mind, I want to introduce you to, to one of my natural laboratories here. This is the tide pool. We call this the tide pool, the little patch of water right across the street from the coastal ecology lab. And, and what I've done here is just take a little, little camera, a GoPro camera attached to a weight, and just set it down on the bottom of this tide pool. It's in about a meter of water. It's very shallow. But you'll see fish swimming by. There's these small triple fins here. There's, there's one there. There'll be some other ones chasing each other around. Um, those, are the, those are my model study species. So those are the species that, that serves as my sort of lab rat for, for answering these questions about what happens to the babies. But everything you see in this image, these larger fish, a spotty, a banded rat, the seaweed, uh, the snails, they all have this marine life history where they're making lots of babies, releasing their babies out into the ocean, and the babies sort of drift away. And the question there is, what happens to all these babies? OK. So this is really a, a story about trying to track fish babies, trying to understand where they go and what they get up to. OK, so this is, this is not a fish baby. This is a great white shark. And this is a colleague and friend of mine, Malcolm Francis, um, jabbing a, 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 a tracking device into the back of this animal. And I'm showing you this as a bit of a tangent, but just to illustrate the value of understanding um, and being able to track a fish and, and, and why you might care. So what Malcolm does, or one of the things he does, he does lots of things. But one of the cool things he does is work with sharks and, and, and attach these satellite tracking devices onto their backs. And he can see where they go. And before he started doing this, we really had no idea where white sharks around New Zealand spent their time. I think the assumption was that white sharks in New Zealand were probably resident populations that weren't going anywhere else but New Zealand. But once Malcolm started tagging these fish, 
we see that they like to go up to the tropics. And so they, the tags, fish that he's tagged around south of New Zealand, they, they all make these forays up to the tropics. So this, this shark that they've named, for whatever reason, they've named it Nicolas Cage, likes to go spend time in, in uh, New Caledonia. And these other animals like to go up to the Great Barrier Reef and hang out. What they're doing up there, who knows? We don't know what they're doing. Malcolm might know now. But um, what this illustrates is if, if we have a management objective to try and protect white sharks or manage their populations, it doesn't matter what we do in New Zealand. These animals are exposing themselves to threats well beyond our borders. They're swimming into other fisheries jurisdictions, potentially available to be harvested, have their fins chopped off, the sorts of things that people do to sharks. Okay, so this is the value of understanding where things go. Basically, this is what I would love to be able to do with, with baby fish, to generate maps like this. Okay, so coming back to, to baby fish, and in particular, these triple fin, these little lab rats that we use. And again, we use them because, they're, because, because what we do is really hard. And so we're starting with something that's, that's as easy as we can possibly make it, these triple fins. Um, and because they share the life history traits of, of, of all the other sort of marine creatures out there that we might care more about, like snapper or blue cod or something that people commercially harvest. Um, but these are relatively easy to work with. And so what do we know about triple fins? Well, we know a fair bit about the adults because we can swim around and, and, and watch them, and we can set cameras out, and we can film them. And we know that they have really interesting um, behavior patterns and, and mating systems. And uh, the, the females will make choices about who they mate with, and, the, and they'll lay eggs in a nest that, that a male defends. And the male will take care of the eggs. So, so this is pretty common in fish. The dads are often the primary caregivers. So, so these dads will look after a batch of eggs on a rock for about two weeks. The eggs hatch. The babies that come out of the eggs are about a millimeter in length. And the babies drift out to sea. And, and we lose track of them. And, and who knows where they go? Right? And this is, this is the, 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 the fundamental question. We have no idea where these babies go, what kills them, what they get up to. With this information, um, we might be able to make some more refined, more sophisticated management recommendations. And of course, these things are far too small to, to, to track in the way that um, Malcolm does with his white shark. Right? If you attach one of these satellite things on, on, these, on these fish, the satellite tags are, are about 10 or 15 centimeters long. These fish are, are about a millimeter when they hatch, right? and, and they're about 20 millimeters when they come back. So you can imagine that. That fish is just going to sink to the bottom. OK, so, so now, so, so it's, it's a bit of a problem. So, so I, now what I want to sort of shift gears and do a little bit of an activity with you guys. This is what we call active learning. Okay? Um, what I want you to do is, is look around you and, and identify somebody in the room that you, you don't know anything about. Maybe they look a little bit interesting to you. And, and, and just gaze at them, but don't make them uncomfortable. Don't, don't stare too hard at them. <laughs> and, and, and what I'm going to ask you to do is to try and hypothesize what that individual's life history is. So, you know, so, you know, maybe try to guess the year they were born. Just keep it to yourself, because it could be offensive. Guess the year they were born. Maybe you can, by looking at them, maybe you say, oh, that person's from, from Southland, New Zealand, or, or somewhere. You, you can make some sort of guess about where they were born. Maybe you can guess, you know, were they a fast grower or a slow grower? Maybe what high school they went to or secondary school they went to. I'll give you 10 seconds or so to, to do that. Everybody's looking at me. <laughs> okay, so now, now imagine that, that you've got really sharp fingers, okay? And you can, you can poke your fingers into the head of that fish going through the ear, and pluck out a little bone, and put it on a, a microscope, and find the answers to all your questions. Wouldn't that be cool? Or, or just a little bit weird. Maybe that'd be weird. <laughs> um, that's essentially what we're doing for, for these fish, right? So, so they're too small for us to tag. We can't ask them where they've been. But we can intercept them. We can collect them on their way back to the reef. And we can reach into their heads, pull out an ear bone, and look at it under a microscope. And we can get a lot of information doing that. Now, I, 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 I will make a mistake and call these ear bones often because I've kind of gotten into the habit. But it's really important to know these are not bones. And the reason that's important is because bones are living tissue that's metabolically reworked. So if an animal goes into starvation, for example, it borrows from its bones and the, and the structure changes. These are, these are ear stones. The technical term is otoliths. And the reason I'm making a big deal of, about this is because given that they're crystals, they are a permanent record. They're a permanent structure that once, once they're built by the fish, they're there forever. 
And people use these things in archaeological middens and all sorts of things to get information out of fish. So they're really cool. Um, and we've known about them for, for a long period of time. People, people, a lot of people work on the, the otoliths of adult fish, which are um, comparatively much easier to work with. Not many people work with uh, otoliths from baby fish. And, and the reason for that is they're really, really small. Right? You, can imagine, you probably didn't even know that fish have ears. How many people didn't know that? Okay, so, some, so good. So people have learned something, at least, so far in this talk. That's good. Um, they've got ears, and they've got these little structures in their ears called otoliths. And, and what, what those structures do is, is that if a sound wave hits the body of a fish, these things are much denser than the body of the fish, and so they rattle around at a different rate, and the fish can detect that as sound. Right? So that's how they, they help the fish hear. And they help us sort of get all this information about the fish. And so this is one of these otoliths sitting on my fingertip. Um, and you can see it nestles in amongst the, 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 the lines of my fingerprint. So that's how small it is. And for us to get the information out of these tiny little ear bones, we have to cut them perfectly in half. It has to go right through the middle to expose these, these lines here, these circular lines. Now, some of you are probably looking at this thinking, gosh, that looks a lot like a, 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 a log, a tree trunk. You chop a tree down, and you see these same sort of rings. And that's exactly what they, they're like. They're growth rings. Um, and you know, if you look at a, if a, at a tree stump, you can count the number of rings, and that's the number of years that tree has been alive. You can say that tree was alive for 157 years or whatever. And you know that how wide those rings are relates to how, how much that, that tree grew in a given year, so how much water it got. And then we can get that same information from these structures. But if we're talking about an ear bone from a baby fish, these, these little rings are daily rings. So they're formed on a daily cycle as part of the circadian rhythm of the animal. Okay. Then we can get lots of information. We, we can age this animal to the day, which is pretty cool. And, and we can also map key events in the life history of this animal onto calendar dates, which is also pretty cool. So for example, we know we collected this fish on the 11th of February in 2008. Um, now, there are, there, are, there are telltale signs on, on these structures about when key things in the life history of this animal happen. So, so when, when the, the, the fish came out of an egg, its growth rate changes. And we can see that change by a change in size of these, these increments. And we know the, the, the point at which that fish hatched. And we can count the number of rings in between that mark, that hatch mark, and the edge of the, the, the ring, the, the last ring that formed in the life of the fish. And we can know that that animal was out drifting in the ocean for 52 days. So immediately we can, we can start reconstructing this hidden life stage of these fish. We don't know where they've gone at this stage, but we know how long they've been out there. And likewise, we can go from the hatch mark down to the center, and we can know that fish was sitting in its egg on a rock being cared for by its dad for, for 12 days before it hatched. Right? So, so we can get all of this sort of information about date and age, and we can get calendar dates. We know the birth date of that animal was the 9th of December, 2007. It's kind of cool, right? And you can, you can potentially sort of ask questions about what the environmental conditions were like over this period of time, and can we explain the growth rate of that fish and, and, and what all sort of it went through. Okay, so, but that's not all. So, so the other thing that we can do is we can borrow from, um, um, basically use some forensic approaches and try and figure out where this fish has been. And the way that this happens is that the ocean is variable in terms of its chemistry. So different parts of the ocean have different trace elements in them. And as a fish is building these rings, it, it incorporates these trace elements into this crystalline structure. So that certain parts, so if you look at certain parts of, of this ear bone and, and figure out the chemical signature associated with that, you can, you can get a chemical fingerprint of the environment or the location that animal was in at a given time. So for example, we can focus on the very center of this ear bone, this part of the ear bone that was forming as that fish was sitting in an egg on a rock somewhere in the ocean. And we can zap out the, this material from this ear bone. The way we, we use a kind of a fancy piece of equipment called a laser ablation inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer to do this. Um, and, and it's quite expensive. But we can, we can get this information out from, the, from the basically characterizing the, the birth site. And we can get chemical information that characterizes the, 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 the water that fish was moving through as it was growing and developing. So after it hatches and starts its journey, we can, we can follow the chemical signatures of that seawater the fish is moving through to try and figure out where it's been. OK, so in theory, we should be able to say, the fish we sampled came from Wellington, or it came from Marlborough Sounds, or it came from Capity, and it spent time developing in, in these, these embayments, or it moved out to sea and then came back, or all sorts of useful things. OK, so now I want to give you an example of, of, of what this data sort of looks like, and what we can kind of do with it, and what more specific questions we can start to ask. 
So I'll talk about some work from our, one of our Marsdens that was focused on um, around Capity Island. And, and for this project, we had a number of goals. I won't go into the details. But we set up a number of sites around the island. We instrumented those sites and characterized the environmental conditions in the water. One of the things we put out were these structures called light traps. We call them light traps. Essentially, they're a, a big sort of metal and plastic box with a bright light in them. The bright light comes on at night. And we don't know why, but for whatever reason, baby fish like to swim to bright light, just like moths like to go to a bright, a bright light. And we can deploy those at night, bring them, collect them. The video is showing us recovering these things the next day. And we can empty out the, 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 the sample into a, into a bucket and preserve it. And we've got a sample of baby fish that we've intercepted. They were on their way from the open ocean back to the reef. And we've, 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 we've got them. And we can reach into their head and pull out their ear bones and tell their story. OK, so some of the kinds of things we might be trying to figure out or trying to ask, for, for all the fish that we get in a given light trap, it would be really interesting to know, particularly if you're a manager trying to understand how these systems work and what you might need to think about, where these fish came from. And do they all come from the same place, or do they come from different places? Does everything in, in your trap have the same origin and the same sort of journey? I, I think of these as little, little airplanes flying around in the ocean. So the same little flight path. Or do they have different origins and different flight paths that fill this trap? And that matters if you're a manager. It, you know, is your site completely dependent upon one other source, or is it getting babies from lots of places, in which case it might be more resilient? Um, we can test some, some ideas about how uh, sort of oceanography affects the, 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 the life cycles of these animals. For example, we might have fish that, that started in different places, but they came together at some point in their development and shared their journey, their final sort of journey into the, the light trap that where we caught them. And this might suggest that fish are aggregating somewhere, maybe, maybe somewhere offshore or somewhere deep, going into some environment and kind of waiting as a group before they migrate in mass onshore. So we have basically no information about, about baby fish at this stage. This is a way to start to try and paint some pictures about what might be happening. And we can, for example, we can also evaluate whether fish are sharing their journey all the way back to their birthplace. And, and what might be happening here would be really interesting to know if, if, if fish are hatching, forming little schools, and this little school of baby fish, maybe, maybe brothers and sisters might be traveling in a group from point A to point B, and, and you might get sort of arrival of fish that are closely related. And again, that has management implications. Okay, so essentially what we're doing is we're trying to reconstruct these flight paths. Um, we know the arrival point. We're trying to evaluate the departure points and the flight paths. And we're doing this by looking at these ear bones, which if we keep with the analogy of airplanes, these are like little flight recorders in the heads of the fish that we can pull out and, and, and figure out this information from. Okay, so the next slide I'm going to show you is a bit of data. So I'm going to forewarn you so you're not, you don't panic when you see some data. It's going to look very similar to what you're seeing here, a, a bunch of sort of colored lines sort of spidery lines, and each line represents a, a flight path for a group of baby fish. Um, and they started in different places, and they, they came to the common um, arrival point, the light trap. That we, we caught them, we intercepted them as they were landing onto the reef. Okay, So here it is. So, so three different lines suggesting that all of the fish that we got in these traps for this particular site and this particular night, we could assign to one of three different sort of histories. They, they came from, from one of three different sort of chemically similar locations, and they had um, particular flight paths that were different from one another. Okay. And so what you're seeing here, so the, the outer points here, these are the departure points. Each successive dot is a successive day going back in the life of, of, of the fish, so starting at the edge of the otolith and going back successive rings back down to the, the birthplace. Um, so these are like the birthplaces, and these are the arrival points. Okay. And the, the light traps where we caught these things. And so this is, this, you're looking at some of the first images of what might be happening with these baby fish out in the ocean. I, so I, I, I stare at these for hours, thinking, gosh, these are amazing. These are exciting. This, by the way, this is, not, um, this is not sort of a geographic representation. This is a, a fish moving through different chemical environments. So, so, so this box here represents chemical space in terms of the chemistry in these ear bones. And we assume that, that, that fish moving through different chemical space are also moving through different types of water. You know, coming from different places, having different experiences. And here we can, we, we, we can, we can sort of interrogate the data a bit further, and we see that, that the fish actually come into a chemically similar, similar environment about a week prior to capture. So they're, 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 they're going somewhere that has, that all, all the fish are going to somewhere that has a similar sort of chemical signature. And maybe they're aggregating in a shoal just offshore, waiting for the opportune time to move onshore uh, to settle to the reef. We, we don't know, but, but this, is, this is more information than we've ever had before. 
Now, that doesn't always happen. That, that, what I've shown you was, was an example of data from one light trap catch. If we look at all of our light trap catches from different nights, we see very different sorts of patterns. So there's a lot of variation in the ocean. And this one's really interesting to me. So, so this particular site was, was being replenished by, by a greater number of, of populations that had chemically different uh, signatures. Um, and, and they started in different places, but they very quickly sort of became similar. They, they got into sort of big, sort of chemically indistinct um, mass of water. And this, this is interesting to me because this is site five. This is the southern end of Kapiti Island. And we know from other oceanographic work that there's a large eddy that sets up uh, sometimes, but not others, around the southern end of Kapiti Island. So, so what I'm imagining is happening here, and this is just speculation at this point, is that you're getting fish coming from lots of different places, and you've got this big whirlpool around the southern end of Kapiti Island that's hoovering these fish up, and they're just circling around for, for up to 30 days, just waiting for to develop big enough that they move on shore and settle. And, th and that's, what we're, that's consistent with what we're seeing here with the water being chemically indistinct. Okay, so we're starting to paint pictures of what might be happening to these baby fish out in the ocean, whereas before we had no information whatsoever. Okay, so aside from being, you know, I'm probably the only person in this room who finds these pictures fascinating, but you, know, you might be asking, why do developmental histories uh, matter? Okay, so I'll try to illustrate that, and in the process I'll, 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 I'll demonstrate another tool that we are trying to use to understand these things. So, so what I'm going to show you is, is um, output from a hydrographic model that we've been working on. So we're trying to, to, to use a simulation to predict where baby fish might move through the ocean. And so what you're seeing is, is the region of Cook Strait. Here's Wellington Harbor. Here's the Marlborough Sounds. Here's Kapiti Island. And the, the, all the blue is Cook Strait. It's, it's water. Um, the black is land. And you're seeing a bunch of colored particles sort of move around the ocean. And what these particles are is, is they're virtual baby triple fin, virtual baby fish sort of drifting out in the ocean and being pushed back and forth and advected in certain directions by ocean currents. Okay, I'll, I'll just um, I'll play that again. So, um, so we've, we've released these particles from places where we know there to be adult triple fins that are reproducing. And so what this suggests is, is where these babies might have gone on a particular um, release date, particular time of month. And what you see is that some of the fish that are produced on the South Island are slowly working their way across the North Island. Um, and there's a lot of sort of mixing happening. And some are staying in embayments, and others are going further offshore. And we know that, that, that I mean, one of the things managers really want to know is, is where the babies are coming from that are supplying the population they care about. So, and likewise, the, the reverse of that question, where are the babies from a particular site, where they're going? And, and, and our work can start to sort of um, shed light on this, right? We, we, can, we can potentially, through the power of the, the chemistry in these ear bones, um, start to sort of uh, tell the story. And we've been doing that, and, and our contributions in this particular question have been more, mostly around method development and, and coming up with better ways to get more information out of the ear bones. Now, now, the area where we've really made contributions uh, is to a slightly different question. And, and our, our group was one of the first to sort of show that this is a really important thing to think about. And that's that it doesn't necessarily just matter where, where, um, where you're going or where you've come from. It, I mean, it matters where you've been. So it matters where you've spent time as a baby fish. So we've got, a, we've got an adult triple fin, a, a dad here defending its eggs. The eggs hatch. The babies go out to sea. Some of those um, eggs will stay close to shore. Um, they'll, they'll get stuck in, in some place like Wellington Harbor or the Marlboro Sounds, or they'll get stuck in, in very near-shore boundary water conditions, and they'll stay in coastal water their whole development. And we can tell this by looking at the chemistry of their ear bones. It looks different from the fish that wash further out offshore. And it turns out that really matters. So fish that spend more time developing as babies in coastal waters before they come back to the reef, they, they look different. They grow faster. They, um, they, they develop more quickly. When they arrive back to the reef, they arrive in better condition. They've got more energetic reserves, more, more fat on their body. And they continue to perform better after they've arrived. They, they grow faster going forward, and they're more likely to survive and reproduce. And we would call those uh, demographic winners. So, so these are the fish that, by virtue of their developmental experience, they're more likely to be successful and contribute to future generations, as compared with these offshore fish, which um, comparatively are what we call losers. Okay, so key message here, um, nursery environments can have lifelong impact. So anybody out there who's a parent or contemplating parenthood, you should worry about where you send your kid to, to crash or preschool. Right? It will affect them forever. It will create them, uh, it will make winners or losers. Right? Um, cool. So, 
So if we look at these, these, these fish that are coming back to a reef, the, the fish that are lucky enough to have survived that 99.99% that mortality rate, he, here are some of them. They're on their way back to settling. These are some baby fish arriving to Breaker Bay, going from the south coast. And if we dip net up those fish and look at their ear bones, there will be a mixture of, of these winners and losers, a mixture of fish that have had these different experiences. And so, so, so this observation really kind of raised a question that we, we developed into another Marsden grant, which was kind of what, what are the consequences of, of these mixtures? This is, a, this is a kind of a general question sort of plaguing ecology more broadly. What happens when you've got different phenotypes of the same species within a population? And, and we thought we had a really good sort of context to look at this. And so the idea is sort of like, if you're a winner, um, are you better off sort of settling in amongst a bunch of losers so that you're kind of king of the castle and you can dominate all the resources? Or does settling with losers actually make you a loser too? Okay, you're hanging out with losers and, and you become one. And, and one way this could happen is because fish that are losers might behave differently. They might behave in a way that attracts the attentions of predators. And you hanging out next to them, now you're suddenly more vulnerable to being eaten. Um, so that was kind of the, the gist of, 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 of one of these sort of margins that we got. And so the approach that we use, and it's, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this story mostly to illustrate the diversity of, of techniques that we use. The approach that we use here is to, is to capture baby fish, bring them back to our coastal ecology lab, rear them up under different environmental conditions, and create these sort of winners and losers, experimental winners and losers, and then put them out into buckets, into sort of environments, and, and see how they respond to different, different uh, tests. Um, and then we can, we can take that, that data from those sorts of experiments and scale them up using mathematical models. So I'm not going to walk you through this, just to sort of show you that we use other skills like, like, like math in ecology. Um, and and we, we, by scaling these sort of results up, we, we can come to some really interesting conclusions. And the conclusions are basically that losers are really, really important to these populations. So having losers in your population actually lowers your risk of extinction over a case where a population is purely winners or purely losers, right? So having this diversity of different types of fish makes populations more stable, more, more resilient. Also makes uh, for larger populations. So you end up with more fish when you have a diversity of these phenotypes within the population. And these are results that aren't intuitively obvious without actually kind of looking at some of the details. Um, and they suggest that losers are important. All right, so losers aren't really losers. Um, And I guess you know you, you could you could make an attempt to connect this back to management, in uh, um, you know if, if, if for, for example one of the management activities we might be pondering is to try and resurrect uh, depleted populations. We might do that by by aqua, through aquaculture, sort of gr growing up baby fish and releasing them into the environment. If in fact that's your management activity, what this work suggests is, is you might want to focus on on creating a diversity of different phenotypes for these fish, not not releasing all the same types of fish. You might not want to focus on just creating a bunch of winners, but having a mixture might be important. Okay, so to kind of just wrap things up, I want to just tell one last story here, and this is the story of, of, of this other system that I've been affiliated with for a number of years. This is a very beautiful place. It's the island of Morea, located in, in the South Pacific, Tahiti in the background, about 170 kilometers from uh, the jumping off point for the waka that came to New Zealand. Right? So it's got th those sorts of interesting connections with New Zealand as well. Now, the reason that I keep going back to this place is probably not for the reasons that you, you're thinking of as you're looking at this picture. You're thinking, oh, gosh, yeah, he goes up better work. Um, the, the key reasons are I can go here and I can collect lots of data, and that's really what motivates and excites me, being able to get lots of data in a short amount of time. Um, and I can do that because the water's warm and I can stay out in the water for eight hours a day. I can't do that so well here. Um, the other reason I, I, I go back here is because, again, it's got, it's got what I need. It provides me with access to study sites in the form of of not one, but two different field stations that I can choose from to use. I mostly use the, the University of California's uh, field station. That's where I've been going uh, for, for almost 25 years. But there's also a, a, a French research station there. So if things get bad at the UC Berkeley station, I can go over to the French station. What that also means is there's a huge network of, of scientists up there working on this island, doing a whole range of things, lots of opportunities to collaborate, lots of, of data sets to make use of that can provide additional um, sort of richness to the stories that I'm trying to, to, to tell. And it's a great place to bring students as well because they have that opportunity to interact with other researchers internationally. So I'm going to show you a little bit of, of footage from, from one of these study sites just to give you a feel for what it's like. It's from that location there. And what you're going to see here are, are a bunch of fish swimming around. This is footage I took last month when we were up there. And, and in this particular place, a lot of these species come here to, to spawn. 
And so these, these, these brown fish, you'll see some spawning activity in a minute, hopefully. Don't let me down. They're gearing up. There they go. So they've just spawned, and I'll do it again in a second. The reason a lot of these fish come here to spawn is because it's the jumping off point for, for the reef. It's, it's the place where the water flows last before it heads out to sea. And the fish come here to try and get their babies off the reef because reefs are really dangerous places. Okay. And fish will come at different times of the month, and some fish will come continuously over the course of the month, and they'll come at different times. And parents basically decide when they're going to spawn. And so, so the, the story here is one that I think everybody in this room can relate to, because everybody, many of you will, will, will be, will have, well, many of you will have children. And so you'll worry about the decisions you make and how you screw up your children. Um, all of you will have parents, and, and probably you're, you blame some of your, your failings on your parents and how they raised you or what they did or didn't do. Right, so, so we can all relate to this. And this is, this is a story we're working on for this latest Mars, and it's really a story about parents and their babies and, and, and the potential conflicts sort of between the decisions they make. And so, so, so parents are making decisions about when and where to spawn, trying to get their babies away from, from the reef where lots of things are trying to eat the babies. The babies go to offshore to the relative safety of, of the open ocean um, where they develop. But then they have to come back to the reef. And so depending upon the time in which those babies were spawned, again, the decisions made by the mom and dad, some of those babies will, will, will come in at a good time, that is when it's dark, when there's no moon, and others will come in at the worst possible time, at the full moon, when it's bright, and all the predators come up off the reef and spend all night gorging themselves on all the babies trying to run this gauntlet back to the reef. And so again, so the focus here is really on, the, on these sort of conflicts between parents and offspring, and, and we're, we're focused on what happens to the babies because we think that's the most important stage. We're using these ear bones to try and reconstruct the stories of these individual fish and in the process of evaluating what we think is, is, is really cool data sets. Okay, so I'm just going to leave you with a little bit of homework. Um, the next time you enjoy a fish meal with, with, with friends or family, um, especially good if it's a white bait fritter, I want you to tell them the story of, of the, the fish ear bone and all the information it contains. And if they're eating a white bait fritter, you can tell them about the hundreds of stories that they're, they're consuming, that, that all that knowledge they're consuming um, by chomping through the ear bones of all those baby fish. Um, and, and, and that's it. So I'll finish with the, the last slide. is just the, the full acknowledgments of, of all the people, past and present students, um, past and present research assistants, and, co and collaborators who have contributed to my ideas over the years. Um, thanks very much.